3. Bell Island Shipwrecks Located south of Newfoundland in Conception Bay, Bell Island is a rugged landmass with a rich mining history dating back to the 19th century. It became one of the world's biggest iron ore producers, and its importance increased during World War II as a crucial contributor to the Allied war effort. German U-boats attacked Bell Island twice in 1942 and sank numerous vessels, leaving behind a multitude of shipwrecks that remain on the ocean floor to this day. The first attack began around noon on September 5th when U-boat 513 torpedoed the Canadian SS Lord Strathcona and the British SS Saganaga, both of which were fully loaded with a cargo of iron ore. It took just three minutes for the Saganaga to sink, taking 29 crew members with her. The Lord Strathcona also sank, but its crew had time to escape and there were no fatalities. After the first attack, the Canadian government installed additional searchlights and took some other measures to better protect the ships near its shoreline. Two months later, at around 3 a.m., a U-boat torpedo narrowly missed the Greek coal freighter Anna T and struck a pier, causing a massive explosion that was so powerful it blasted the windows out of some of the island's homes. The U-boat then struck two Orfield cargo ships in a passing convoy. Two torpedoes slammed into the British SS Rose Castle, killing 24 crew members and sending the 459-foot ship to the bottom of the Atlantic. The crew initially survived the sinking, clinging desperately to debris in the frigid northern waters, but then a torpedo struck the British-owned free French ship called the Paris Lyon Marseille 27. The explosive slipped beneath the waves in just 60 seconds, detonating underwater and claiming the lives of 12 men. Pierre Simard, an able-bodied seaman, described how the PLM-27 sank like a brick, giving their survivors no time to deploy lifeboats or help less fortunate crew members who were unable to escape. He swam for a half hour and collapsed from exhaustion as soon as he reached the shore. Remembered today as the Battle of Bell Island, the attacks claimed a total of 65 lives and the cost of allies thousands of tons of valuable iron ore. To prevent history from repeating itself a third time, the Canadian government placed anti-submarine nets in Conception Bay. It proved to be an effective measure, and there were no more attacks in the area throughout the remainder of the war. All four wrecks are well preserved due to the dark, cold conditions they came to rest in. The shallowest among them is the PLM-27, which which sits at a depth ranging from 50 to 100 feet. The deepest shipwreck belongs to the Rose Castle at 100 to 150 feet below the surface. It's known as the Jewel of Bell Island wrecks for its pristine condition as well as the growth of corals and other organisms that are seen less often on other ships. In 2019, the Canadian government recognized the Battle of Bell Island as a national historic event. An official memorial was constructed in 2022 along with an information panel describing the attacks that took place here, ensuring that this battle and the men who lost their lives as a result are never forgotten. 2. Villa Epesuen Villa Epesuen, founded in Buenos Aires province, Argentina during the 1920s, was once a tourist village that drew visitors in with claims that their saltwater lake, Lago Epesuen, contained healing properties. At the time, the lake was the world's second saltiest body of water, with saline levels ten times higher than any of the oceans. The village's tourism industry got its start with the help of an Englishman, who leased a large portion of land and promoted the town's health benefits, even going as far as hiring scientists to support his claim. At its peak, Villa Epesuen had thousands of residents and could accommodate more than 5,000 visitors. It was home to 280 businesses including hotels, lodges, guest houses, and other establishments that catered to both the local and visiting populations. On November 6, 1985, following years of unusually heavy rains and consistently rising water levels, the lake breached a nearby dam that was built to protect Villa Epesuen from flooding. Residents awoke to find the village waterlogged, with levels ranging from ankle deep to four feet. Left with no other choice but to abandon their homes, the population packed what they could and fled to the nearby city of Carhue, hoping that the flooding was temporary and they'd be able to return soon enough. However, their hopes were dashed as the floodwaters continued to encroach on the deserted village, reaching a depth of 10 feet within two weeks of the initial breach. By 1993, Villa Epesuen was submerged in 33 feet of water. Decades of heavy rainfall were followed by years of light precipitation, and in 2009, the lake began 
began to recede for the first time in decades. Buildings, cars, dead trees, and other fixtures began to appear, revealing the effects of prolonged saltwater exposure. Sections of the village are still underwater, leaving a partially submerged apocalyptic wasteland that continues to draw in tourists, but for vastly different reasons than health and rejuvenation. The re-emerging structures and vehicles are heavily corroded and caked in a thick layer of grey and white salt, making it clear that returning to Villa Apesuen was out of the question. For most people, at least, one former resident, 85-year-old Pablo Novak, moved back to the village in 2009, becoming its first resident in nearly 25 years. He took up residence in an abandoned house and is the only person to ever return to Villa Apesuen, where he takes care of his two cows and enjoys solitude. Even the senior citizen's wife chose not to follow him there. Novak's dust-covered home lacks electricity and is filled with rusting furniture and old calendars. He told CNN that he'd lost hope that the town would be rebuilt, but he chose to stay there anyway. The elderly gentleman, whose life is chronicled in the 2013 documentary called Pablo's Villa, spends his days wandering the empty streets and observing the crumbling ruins with a longing sense of nostalgia for its golden days and he says that he's perfectly happy doing so. It's unclear whether the region is expected to experience another wet period that will once again cause the lake's waters to rise and resubmerge Villa Epestuen. But at the moment, there's no plans to rebuild, and the only thing that will continue to attract people to the village are its dilapidated remains. In some areas, all that's left of the buildings that once stood are collapsed piles of debris, or the occasional recognizable item like an old bathtub or bed frame. A staircase to nowhere marks where a beauty salon once stood, and old vehicles have been reduced to little more than decaying metal masses. However, some structures are identifiable, including a former slaughterhouse, a theater, and the headstones filling the town's cemetery. Would you ever decide to live in a completely abandoned village all by yourself? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. 1. The Graveyard of the Atlantic the waters off North Carolina's Outer Banks are historically known as some of the most treacherous in the world, owing to the region's constantly shifting sands, unpredictable currents, and its positioning against the Gulf Stream current. One of the most infamous features of the Outer Banks is a cluster of shallow sandbars known as the Diamond Shoals. Extending for eight miles off Cape Hatteras, the shoals are thought to be responsible for as many as 600 of the more than 5,000 recorded shipwrecks that have occurred in the region. For that reason, the area has since been nicknamed the Graveyard of the Atlantic. In addition to the dangerously shallow waters of the Outer Banks, the area is notorious for its severe storms, which often happen out of nowhere and have sent many ships to their watery graves since record-keeping began in 1526. One of the most famous shipwrecks to wreck in the Outer Banks was the Queen Anne's Revenge. It arrived at Beaufort Inlet in 1718 under the command of Edward Teach, better known as Blackbeard the Pirate. The vessel ran aground on a sandbar, forcing the captain and his crew to transfer what they could of their supplies and spoils onto a smaller ship. Blackbeard abandoned Queen Anne's revenge and dropped several of his crew members off on an island with no plans to return for them. In 1996, explorers rediscovered the pirate's flagship in 28 feet of water, roughly a mile from the coastal city of Atlantic Beach. Over 300,000 artifacts have been recovered from the wreck, including a bronze bell, navigational instruments, dinnerware, 30 cannons, and personal effects, such as clothing and jewelry. In 1750, 32 years after the sinking of Queen Anne's Revenge, a Spanish treasure ship called the El Salvador ran aground in the same area during a hurricane. According to historical records, the ship was badly destroyed and was left buried in several feet of sand. Only four crew members survived this tragic event. The El Salvador's cargo of gold and silver has never been recovered from the wreck and is at the center of a years-long court battle over who has the rights to the hoard. Two of the six treasure-laden merchant ships that the vessel was traveling with also went down in the storm. Another one of the more well-known Outer Banks wrecks is the ironclad U.S. Navy warship USS Monitor. Commissioned by President Abraham Lincoln in 1862 in response to news that the Confederate military was building a similar type of ship, 
monitor was built from start to finish in just three months. However, the 179-foot-long vessel's career was cut short not too long after entering service when it encountered a brutal storm while being towed by a tugboat and sank 16 miles off Cape Hatteras. Some of the graveyard of the Atlantic's wrecks are surprisingly close to the shore. In 1925, a three-masted schooner called the Irma crashed into the beach at Kill Devil Hills while it was headed to Georgia with a load of timber. The Coast Guard rescued the crew, and the beach ship went on to function as a makeshift dance hall for the next six years before a storm finally began pulling it apart and sucking it back into the ocean. Since then, it occasionally reappears above the water. Just 600 feet off the coast of Kill Devil Hills are the remains of two ships that sank in the same spot two years apart from each other. One of the vessels is the Kaizikes, an American tanker that struck a sand reef in 1927. The other ship, a Swedish freighter called the Carl Gerhard, met the same fate in 1929 when it struck the Kaizikes, breaking the older wreck in half. Today they sit in just 20 feet of water. Conditions along the Outer Banks became even more perilous during World War II, when German U-boats laid siege to at least 400 merchant vessels in the region, ending the lives of more than 5,000 people. These attacks earned it the nickname of Torpedo Alley or Torpedo Junction. Most of the ships sank in 1942, during what the Nazis called the Second Happy Time. Just weeks into the period, the newly built British tanker SS Empire Gem and the American cargo steamer SS Venor were torpedoed off Diamond Shoals. All but two of the Empire Gem's 57-man crew died, and 17 of the Venor sailors lost their lives as a result. A few months later, a 463-foot-long British tanker called the SS San Delfino was attacked off Cape Hatteras while sailing from Houston in Texas to Halifax, Nova Scotia. The first torpedo caused a fuel tank to catch fire, but it ultimately took seven torpedoes to destroy the ship. One of the quickest Allied merchant ships to go down was the Carib Sea, a 260-foot-long cargo vessel that sank in under three minutes after being struck on its starboard side by two torpedoes. There are dozens of other Allied wrecks from this period scattering the floor of Torpedo Alley, and while the German casualties were much fewer, not all U-boats emerged from their destructive mission unscathed. In 2014, a submarine designated U-576 was discovered 30 miles off Cape Hatteras. Its commander, Hans-Dieter Heinecke, had started the journey back to Europe after the boat became damaged. He had very little success with destroying Allied ships during the month-long patrol, so when he crossed paths with a merchant convoy, he decided to make a last-ditch effort to inflict some damage. He managed to sink one freighter before U.S. forces swiftly took out the U-boat. U-576 was just one of several U-boats that came to rest in the graveyard of the Atlantic, serving as a sobering reminder of just how close the war came to U.S. shores. This unforgiving region continues to pose deadly hazards to modern-day ships. During Hurricane Sandy in 2012, a replica of the three-masted HMS Bounty floundered in shallow 18-foot waves. In 2020, a 72-foot fishing vessel called the Ocean Pursuit ran aground on Bodie Island, where it's slowly being swallowed by the sand and is only surrounded by water at high tide. While new wrecks continue to appear throughout the graveyard of the Atlantic, old ones are still being discovered, adding to the seemingly never-ending list of losses that define this unique region. Which of these underwater places would you most like to visit? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget, subscribe. I'll see you next time.